Right. Okay, with the last video, I got to the stage of showing that the government uh, issuing bonds to match the gap between spending and taxation provides the banking sector with the, fun the funds it needs to buy the bonds, and it'll buy the bonds because it's offered a higher rate of interest on bonds than it is on reserves. So it's simply an asset swap for the banks, transfer money from the reser reserves, earning no or less interest across to bonds that earn some or more interest, and, and therefore it's a sensible allocation. And as I said, the money is created by the government running the deficit in the first place. Now, the one thing I haven't quite got here yet is the role of the central bank in buying and selling bonds uh, uh, with, the, with the financial sector. The reason it does that is not because it's needed to create money by the government, as we'll see shortly when I simulate all these together, uh, but to, because it's trying to set a target rate for the interest rate that it's set on the bonds. So it buys and sells bonds uh, to, to control the, the price of short-term government bonds, which it's got, it's got the capacity to do. Um, and that um, variation keeps the interest rate, uh, which is the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with a very short-term bond, the interest rate and the bond price move inversely. The, government's, the central bank has a limitless capacity to buy those bonds. Uh, because it's crediting its assets and its liabilities at the same time, it's, a, it's simply bookkeeping for them. And with that capacity, they can set the interest rate to remain in a band around the target rate they've set with their, uh, with the, in the case of the US government, with the Federal Reserve Open Market Operations Committee. Now, I want to bring in those open market operations now. So what I need to do is show the possibility that the central bank can actually own government bonds. At the moment, I have the only... Uh, bonds that can be owned by the, anybody in the system are the bonds that the Treasury has sold to the banks, and I've indicated that by T, uh, subscript B, on the, um, on the asset side of the banking systems ledger here. And what I now, now need to do is to make the same uh, class of asset possible for the central bank as well. So I'm going to create another column here, and I'm going to call this Treasury Bonds and superscripted CB for bonds owned by the central bank. So I've got that. Now, when, it buy, when the central bank buys these bonds, it buys it by crediting the reserve account of the um, <coughs> private banks. So you have the CB buys bonds from banks, then you're going to have, uh, and as I say, CB under uh, lowercase b, or the subscript b, subscript on the banks, so that's the increase in its assets, and there's a matching increase in its liabilities, that's the money it's putting in the bank's reserve accounts to purchase the bonds off them. And again, this is something they can do because uh, you know there's uh, banks are forever involved in buying and selling the bonds, taking advantage of the price movements and so on. So, um, speculating on price movements. So there we have the central bank uh, having bought the bonds off the um, off the banks. That means the amount of money, the, the money monetary worth of the bonds of banks. I do have has fallen, so we just make account of that. So it's an asset swap, again in the opposite direction. To the, the, the Treasury selling bonds to the uh, banking sector is an asset swap from the reserves of the bank to the, tre the, the bonds, Treasury bonds held by the banks. Central bank operations are in the, in the opposite direction, but they can be positive or negative, so I'm going to make it possible to have a positive or negative range for that particular operation. So that's uh, covers that extra detail there. So we now have CB, um, sub subscript B, superscript B. Yeah. It's complicated saying all that stuff. Uh, okay, so I've done that. So I now just want to um, make a bit of space here. I might just convert these back to icons because after a while it gets a bit um, difficult seeing all these tables on screen. So I'll just, whoops, I'll just with some things which. Well, a rubber banding and stretching of objects like this uh, is not perfect at the moment. This is one of the things we're working on in the current beta. 
of Minsky to um, make this, this uh, manipulation of Goplic tables more straightforward. So I now want to bring off the uh, copy all the stock variables here, and I just want to let's drag them up here. What I'm looking at is the treasury bonds held by the central bank. I can just delete that lot. And I want to bring up the flow variables as well. This is a bit cumbersome at the moment. We're going to be working on this to improve this in the next version. So delete that. And I want to take a copy of so that central bonds, that's the flow of central bonds, central bank uh, purchases of bonds from the um, um, from the private banks. And I want to have some control on that. How, how much does that actually uh, represent? So I'm going to say it's based on the government deficit. It's some fraction of the government deficit that the central bank decides to cover by uh, buying bonds itself. And I'll call this operation, and pardon me for being out of the screen down there, OMO, Open Market Operations. It's actually a detergent name in Australia, I presume it's similar in America. So there's OMO, and that's going to be a parameter, and I'll give an initial value of zero, saying the central bank is not actually buying any bonds. Maximum of 100%, let's make a maximum of 200%, because sometimes they buy more bonds that were issued than in the last uh, deficit. They, they, they can decide to buy any number of outstanding bonds, and that's a, a shift of um, a range of 10% movement in the, in the parameter there. So I now multiply open the open market operation, which is a control variable by the central bank, so it makes sense to make that a parameter. Multiply that by the government deficit, and that is now equal to how many bonds purchased by the central bank from uh, private banks. So I've wired that up. And now I've got, and then now I've got uh, the Treasury, uh, uh, of course, now has bonds which are owned by the central bank. So let's just assume that exactly the same interest rate that the Treasury pays to the private banks is paid to the tre to pay to the central bank as well, and that then becomes an interest payment. Pardon me, let's drag this over here. Becomes an interest payment to by the treasury to the central bank. So I'll call this. I've got IB underscore a, I sub B superscript B. It's complicated to say that stuff all the time, but anyway. Um, that's interest on bonds now paid to the central bank. And I don't need to define that any further there. So let's just now include that as a variable um, for the treasury and the central bank here. So pay interest on bonds to CB. And that, of course, is going to take money out of the um, deposit account of the Treasury at the central bank. And that, of course, is going to reduce the Treasury's equity once more. But there's a little trick here, and that is, of course, that who uh, the uh, the interest payments on the central bank, uh, who do they go to ultimately? Well, the Treasury, in terms of the, own, the structure of the government, Treasury owns the central bank. So the central bank um, is going to pay and does pay dividends to Treasury. So I'm now going to have, I've got dividends earlier. Uh, from the private bank, uh, private uh, corporations to to capitalists. Now we're going to have dividends uh, from the central bank, uh, and that is therefore going to increase the um, assets and the equity of the um, treasury. And what is the value of that dividend flow? <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty much the interest.
that's being earned on those bonds. So I'll just again, this is getting a fairly fairly messy canvas here. Um, for those who haven't used Minsky before, Minsky actually um, has got an enormous design canvas. This screen you're looking at as on my laptop is 4,000 pixels this way by 2,000 pixels that way. But the actual design canvas is 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So you could put this on a you know, giant monitor and have enormous complexity. I'm just basically showing everything uh, on the one screen to keep the complexity down. Now I've forgotten by giving that little rave as to what I called um, the flow. So it's D under D lower uh, subscript CB. So D subscript CB ends up there, and those, and those are the dividend payments. So one cancels out the other. Now I was going to save this now uh, with the name Omo. Well, Omo is part of the name. And that is a complete model. Uh, the simplest possible standard for the monetary flows of modern monetary theory. And uh, I'm going to t uh, write, write a paper on this. I, I can't resist the, uh, the palindrome effect that I can actually not title the paper, uh, The Mathematical Model of Modern Monetary Theory, which is a palindrome. Um, but in fact, it's probably better called uh, One mathemat Mathematical Model of Modern Monetary Operations, uh, which is a palindrome <laughs> in, from the middle as well as uh, either end. And this is one of the points that uh, the advocates of modern monetary theory say when they are talking about the financial aspects of modern monetary theory, the job guarantee is an extra element that uh, doesn't have the same status um, in terms of how it is just what happens. Uh, the job guarantee is a policy proposal. The, uh, the, this, this is modelling strictly the monetary flows that occur in a modern monetary economy where the money is created in two ways, by fiat by the government or by credit by the private banks, uh, and where that money is not tied uh, to any commodity as it, as it was to some bizarre extent under the gold standard. So this is now a complete model. Uh, and I can now see what happens in various cases. Uh, I've got to add a couple of other variables. I've got to, looking at the debt ratio of the non-government sector here, I need the debt ratio of the government as well. And the only part of that debt that matters, of course, is its debt to the private banks. Uh, the central bank debt is you know, debt to yourself, effectively. So let's just actually drag that up a bit. OK, so what I'm going to define that debt ratio. And I've got the other debt ratio over here. Um, so I need to define, to bring over the GDP. And this is, the debt is actually the treasury bonds that have been issued. And if I now divide treasury bonds outstanding by GDP, uh, I get a debt ratio. And if I then multiply that by 100, take a copy of this constant over here. That's now a debt ratio of the government. And whack this up here. Now, of course, I've illustrated, I hope, that that debt is nothing like, in its consequences, the debt of a private uh, sector individual. The government can run as big a gap as it likes between its spending and its taxation. It doesn't have to issue these. It's just the legal requirement that it does issue bonds, uh, which is written into most countries' constitutions in various ways. Uh, and then uh, those those bonds that are purchased, the money that's needed to purchase them by the, by the private banks is created by the deficit itself in the first case because that boosts banks' reserves. They are then attracted to an asset swap, convert non-interest earning reserves into interest earning bonds and then the central bank can get involved in buying and selling those bonds uh, which it does to try to control the price of the bonds and therefore keep the interest rate at the level it set as its target and its monetary policy operations. So that's our complete model. And I just want to start it 
uh, at a situation where there's no government deficit and no net lending. So this is my baseline situation. And so what you get out of that, I was let this random number bounce around for a while, for the um, non-government equity, which I say, because I mean, explained in an early video, that is not a, 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 a major number. It's 10 to the minus 14 multiplied by the elements there, which is a computer approximation error. So what you get in the absence of the government actually doing any spending is the non-bank, non-government sector is in negative equity relative to the banking sector, which must be in positive equity. And then the government spending, which I'll bring in, in uh, when I do the next video, uh, changes the net equity position of the, positive, of the private sector. If the government runs a deficit, it increases the equity of the private sector. If it runs a surplus, it reduces that equity. And I wanted to see what are the macroeconomic impacts of doing that uh, with this model, where I can actually separate out what happens when the bank uh, from the private banks to what happens with the government and give a, a bit of an insight, uh, I hope, which will be a bit of a surprise to some people about where did the Great Depression come from, for example.